Hello and uh, welcome today to Mountain Valley Fellowship here in Hagen, Montana. I'm Pastor Alan Dameron and uh, we're glad you decided to join us. Today we have a, uh, what we would call a special surprise treat for us. Um, Stephen Berry, longtime friend, minister in the gospel and just retired from uh, being an army chaplain and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and we're just excited to welcome him to our, our pulpit today to speak God's word to us. And, uh, and in doing so, we're going to continue to pray for God's moving in your life and speaking to you. If you need Christ as your Savior, today would be absolutely the best day in the world for you to say, Yes, Lord Jesus, come into my life and, and, and save me. And brothers and sisters in Christ, God's got a word for you today. And So now let's go to the service. And as uh, Brother Stephen opens the word faithfully to us, Let's ask God to hear so that we might hear His message to our lives. Welcome to Mountain Valley Fellowship in Hagen, Montana, where we're bringing God's message to the valley. Well, good morning. Good to see everyone here today on this lovely winter morning in January at Hagen, Montana. Everybody's got to be somewhere, and uh, here we are, and I'm glad about it. Um, I was reminded this morning of uh, uh, my daughter's comment to me on the occasion of me being asked to speak at uh, my son's graduation from the 75th Ranger Regiment's Ranger Indoctrination Program. It was at the time it was a three-week program, screening and training and assessment for lower enlisted soldiers going to the Ranger Regiment. And it was a beautiful sunny day at Fort Benning. All the chairs out, the guys that were gonna graduate were all formed up, ready to move front and center. Parents there, grandparents, sweethearts, wives, everyone was in a gay and festive mood. And I had my notebook with my repair, prepared comments and was feeling pretty good about it all. And just before we started, my daughter leaned over, sitting behind me, tapped me on the shoulder and said, I said, you know, yes, sweetie, or something like that, I'm sure. She said, Daddy, just remember, nobody came to Fort Benning today to hear you talk. Kind of put me in my place. I had a little swollen head there about speaking at Michael's Rip graduation. So while I don't think you necessarily came today to hear me talk, we did come today to hear what God has to say uh, from His Word. And so... Uh, we will do that shortly. If you want to find the text, uh, it is Genesis 28, uh, 20 through, uh, or um, I'm sorry, 10 through 17. Genesis 28, 10 through 17. I heard a story of a man who was uh, walking back to his car after attending, attending a theater production. Um, it was nighttime, the street was dimly lit, and... Uh, scarcely lit by just a few street lights. And he saw ahead of him uh, on the street in the pale glow of one of those street lights, a man on his hands and knees scurrying around. And it, was, it became apparent to him that the other man, the one in the, on the ground, was looking for something. He was uh, pretty desperate. And so when he approached and asked the question, obvious question, the man on the ground said he was looking for his car keys. And so the good-hearted fellow joined in and going to help his brother out who lost the keys. And so together, on hands and knees, they scoured the pavement looking for these keys. And after a few minutes, the good Samaritan uh, said to his friend, Bud, I don't think we're going to find your keys. To which the man responded, well, I didn't drop them here. I dropped them back down the street. The guy's like, well, why on the earth are you, aren't you looking where you dropped them? The man said, because there's no light down there. Okay? So sometimes we're prone to look for things in places that are convenient for us. It's where we would prefer to search uh, without maybe regard to where they really might be found. You know, something you're looking for is always in the last place you look. If I'd known that to begin with, I'd have looked there first, right? But... You have to go through the rigmarole and check all the blocks. And uh, we'd rather look for something lost or, or something we desire in a place where we'd like to look for it. 
just doesn't work that way, does it? If you were looking, if you were looking to find the Lord today, where would you look? If you wanted to avoid God today, where would you go to get out of sight? The Bible says even if we descended into the place of the dead, the Hebrew word is shell, parallel with Hades in the Greek New Testament, the place of the dead, uh, that even if we descended to the place of the dead, He is there. But if you wanted to find God today, where would you look? Let's read this passage here and uh, see if we can draw a lesson or two from Jacob's experience. Um, I'll give you a little background up to verse 10. So Isaac, Jacob's father, called Isaac in and said, Hey, listen, I want you to, it's time for you to get married. I want you to take a wife, but I don't want you to take a wife from the Canaanites. Um, that's just not going to be good. So I want you to get up, get your gear, and I want you to move out to um, Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, so his grandfather's house, um, and take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother, so a cousin as we would know it. Uh, he said, you know, may, may God bless you with the blessing of Abraham so that you uh, and all your descendants can possess the land of your sojournings. Kind of that uh, reference in Joshua, wherever your foot lands, it's yours. So he prayed that God would bless him with the, with the uh, space through which his journey would go. Uh, and he sent him away uh, to find his wife in the house of... Uh, um, his uh, uncle. And verse 6 now says, Esau, remember Jacob and Esau, the, you know, cheated him at his birthright for a bowl of chili, you know. Um, Esau saw that Isaac um, had blessed Jacob and sent him to find a wife and that he told him not to find a wife from the Canaanites. Well, since since Esau, who's the oldest, had traded away his birthright, he is perpetually behind the power curve. He is, he is totally done in, and he's trying to please his father and gain favor again in his father's eyes. So Esau goes to take a wife in addition to the other ones he has. Um, and he goes uh, to the family of Ishmael. Um, what do you remember about Ishmael? Remember, God promised Isaac or uh, Abraham and Sarah um, a son, and uh, I, uh, Abraham got tired of waiting and went to, you know, his concubine, and she gave birth to Ishmael, followed by Isaac. Now, the lineage of Ishmael follows into Muhammad and the current uh, Muslim expression that we know in the world. So Esau went to Ishmael and and still went to an outcast group. He still didn't help himself. Here's a guy who just can't seem to get it right. We would say at home he would just snake bit. You know, nothing was going right for him. But now we pick up in verse 10, and so Jacob uh, is getting ready to leave with his father's instructions. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went into Haran, and he came to a certain place, and he spent the night there because the sun had set. Well, that makes sense. It got dark, and... So uh, he bedded down, and he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head, and he lay down in that place, and he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set on the earth, and its top reaching to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the, God, the Lord, God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants." Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and in your descendants shall all the family of the earth be blessed. If you wonder why the Jews have a claim uh, or expect they have a claim to the land, I mean, it just reinforces why that uh, is so and might be so. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. 
Doesn't matter where you go, I won't leave you until I've done what I promised. Then Jacob woke up from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid, he was overcome. And he said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of heaven, house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. And he called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Bethel, of course, means house of God. Um, when Jacob, uh, then Jacob made a vow, and this is really the first instance we have of this kind of religious vow being made to the Lord. If God will be with me, will keep me on this journey that I take, will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, and if I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone, which I've set up as a pillar, will be God's house, and of all that you give to me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Boy, there's a lot packed in there. So God said, or uh, um, Isaac uh, called Jacob in and he said, listen, I'm going to pray that, that God will give you all the land encompassed in your journey as you make your way. We'll see in a minute why that's kind of important. Uh, as you make your way. And then the Lord promised him um, on the, the land on which you lie. Remember, he was lying down with a stone and rock under his head asleep on the land on which you lie, uh, I will give it to you and I will bring you back to this land, um, which will be yours uh, and your descendants. And Jacob said, uh, the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. This is an awesome place. Well, I'm glad he felt that way. Um, the distance between... Um, Beersheba and where he was going to his uncle's house and uh, Padan Haram is impressive. That's about 600 miles. 600 mile foot movements not to be trifled with. No wonder he was going to need some more clothes and plenty of food to eat. And no wonder he was tired. He was, uh, was on foot, apparently didn't have any lavish equipment. Um, in Genesis 32, verse 10, Jacob will note, he observes that in past time, he crossed the same land on foot with nothing but his staff in his hand. So pretty austere uh, travel, uh, some privation involved in this austere setting. Used a stone as his pillow. Um, I got to tell you, that's not all that bad. I've got some good sleep on concrete hangar floors around the world and have slept on my uh, steel pot and Kevlar helmet lots of nights and called it good. So, you know, he could have he been worse off without the stone, I suppose. Anyway, along the way, he stopped for the night to get some sleep in the middle of the desert with his stone for his pillow. In the middle of the night, he dreamed a dream. And I expect, I mean, who knows what the star count looked like, but it gets dark in the desert. It's dark in the mountains, you know that. It gets dark out there. Um, and he dreamed a dream, and in his dream, the Bible says he saw a stairway, a ladder that was connected to earth and connected to heaven. We used to sing in Sunday school when I was a little kid, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. Every rung goes higher, higher. Um, and angels were descending and ascending the steps, and God Himself stood at the top and spoke to Jacob, promised to give him the land on which he was camped, to make him the father of many, more than the grains of dust. He's not sand, but He said the word is dust. And not to leave him. Behold, I'm with you. I will keep you. Remember last week we talked about reading the Scripture, putting an emphasis on on every next word. So maybe it would be like, Behold, I am with you. Behold, I am with you. No one less than myself is with you. Behold, I am with you. Behold, 
I am with you. You see, boy, that just, that's rich to me. Behold, I am with you and, but wait, there's more. Behold, I am with you and I, yet again, I didn't send somebody else, nobody less than me, I will, you could almost say surely, keep you. I will keep you. I will keep you. I will keep you wherever. I will keep you wherever you, wherever you go. That takes a little time to read, especially a long verse like that, but man, you just capture so much richness, I think. <laughs> think about it like that. So just to recap this important promise, this is a tripartite trauma, promise, three parts. He promised to give Jacob offspring as numerous as the grains of dust in the earth. He promised to give them a land where they would live. And he promised Jacob a keeping, a safeguarding, that is guaranteed regardless of Jacob's, uh, apparently, his experience and circumstances. There was no conditions placed on this. I will do this, I will do this, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will not leave you until I fulfilled all my promises. Wow. Now that's not a license just to go out and live like a wild man, but that is a license to pursue um, within the boundaries of God's goodness what God has promised with a vengeance, I suppose. Now, surprisingly, this kind of goes back to my earlier question, this revelation comes to Jacob where he might have least expected it, in the desert in the night, sleeping on a rock. I mean, if you think about a circumstance, that's stripped pretty bare of nice accoutrements. You know, trousers, dress, sweater, shoes, a dry place. Well, it's probably a dry place to sleep, all right. But <laughs> that's the point. It was dry. Uh, with a stone for your pillow. You know, like uh, some of us were talking about it this morning, many of us who wear the arm uh, uniform of America's armed forces have spent time deployed to some of the world's barren places. Vanessa and I both have. Um, Qatar, pretty civilized. Saudi Arabia, Dubai, all the Emirates, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the worst place of all, West Texas. <laughs> I have heard it said that after God made West Texas, he realized he'd made such a mess instead of correcting the topographical part. He just made a bunch of people who'd like it that way. Uh, that, may be, uh, that may be how it is. When a kid runs away from home in West Texas, the parents cannot report him missing for a week because they can still see him. So he has to be gone longer than a week. No, not really. It's, it's hard to forget the, from Desert Storm that the seemingly endless vast nothingness. Um, I mean, the Great Sand Sea is with the dunes and stuff. But just vastness of the Saudi Arabian desert, that broad, dusty frying pan that is the Kuwaiti desert, uh, the vastness of Al-Anbar province in Iraq, um, or the desolation of Kandahar and Helmand, and nobody who's been to Fob Leatherneck, as we noted, can forget that sweet place, a garden spot. Just think of moon dust, and you'll be there. For somebody like me that grew up in the forest and flowing creeks of deep East Texas, these desert places look like the face of Mars. I mean, they're, they're alien a little bit. I'm more used to it now, but it, my first experience was uh, quite an eye opener. Stretches of brown, dusty, nothingness, it seemed. And I've heard people use the phrase God-forsaken land to describe places like that. Um, I told you before, as you know, I served with the Damrons in ministry in Haver, which is not that far from here, 150 miles, 200 miles, not that far. More muscle manos, okay. And uh, we would have people come up from Texas, Oklahoma and Louisiana and Arkansas and other places. And we've just come to help you in this God-forsaken land. 
Well, I, I'm a Texan. That offended me pretty quickly because God was present in that place with us, fulfilling His promises, and He was at work. The immense <laughs> barrenness of a place or the emptiness of a place or the propensity of a place to be really, really cold and really, really windy um, doesn't mean God's not there at work, although it might not seem like the place where you would find God. I mean, after all, would you expect to find the Lord God residing in a lush place like a perfect garden uh, or on a majestic mountaintop? We rode up a couple days ago to Seely Lake. Oh, my goodness. And we looked at a house that had its backdrop across this canyon, the Mission Mountains. Oh, my word. I could have gone to glory from there, I'm telling you. Would, wouldn't you think you'd find God in, in a perfect place accompanied with life and beauty and lushness? That's not the desert. Desert's just not like that. Desert's got creepy, crawly camel spiders and scorpions and, uh, yes, Virginia, there are rattlesnakes in Afghanistan. Um all kind of woolly worms and things that, you know, you just wouldn't expect to find God maybe in the creepy crawly place. They're all kind of desert experiences. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I, I'm going to mix my metaphors too. There's two things that preachers should never do. One is mix metaphors, and you'll see when I get there that I'm doing it, and I confess that I'm doing it. And I'm going to use an illustration as though it were mine, and it's not. So, Bryn Bishop, if you happen to see this uh, on YouTube, it's your illustration, brother. I'm just claiming it for today, but we know it's not mine. Um, it's the desert, so it doesn't have to be a place necessarily. As a, as a, a geographical place on the earth, it doesn't have to be a ten-digit grid in the sand. It can be a place in your life, a station in life. As we move from, the, from birth, from the cradle to the grave, in the meantime, we pass through some places where life just seems bone dry, where there seems to be no life. You might think of it as illness or depression or maybe nothing, just nothing's coming your way, you know? And God may seem real to us when all is well. That old gospel song, my God is real, He's real in my soul. Well, yeah, I got dry clothes and I'm all filled with good food and got a place to sleep and people who will hug my neck. And, but boy, if I change the circumstances, I might not feel that way. When we feel secure and at peace, all is well and God is good. But what about those times when life takes unexpected turns? A right hand turn, a five mile an hour turn, unexpected. And then after you make the turn, you find out the road's unpaved. Things were going so well. What about those times when we experience painful and profound loss? What about those times when someone or something visits violence and harm upon us or upon those whom we love? How about that family that lost their home to the fire last night? I wonder what they're thinking about God's presence this morning. I wonder if they have an assurance. I mean, I don't know, but put yourself in their spot. Go to bed at night and all is well, and sometime before the sun comes up, things have changed? What about personal injury or sickness? What about that? What about times when we, we are encounter deep disappointment and what uh, Winston Churchill called black dog despair? What about those times when our most treasured and intimate relationships are broken and trust is shattered? Trust is always the first casualty. And it's hard to revive trust as it was before it was uh, wounded. You know, in some of those times, maybe we find that our faith itself is just hanging by a thread. And we ask God why. We want to know why. These, these 
stations in our life, these circumstances, these predicaments, can represent the dark nights of the soul when it's just so dark and you can't find your way in your heart. Sorry. <laughs> and we feel perhaps that God has forsaken us or that this station where we are, God cannot be found here. We've been left alone in a circumstance which he's forgotten about. But Jacob, in the story, in the desert, in the night, sleeping on a rock, discovered that, in fact, God was there, right with him. And he woke up from the dream, and he was amazed. I was having a dream last night, and I was just wearing this guy out. I mean... You know, I had him right where I wanted him, and I was grunting and flailing around and sat bolt upright, and I'm fighting the covers, and Vanessa's like, it's just a dream. It's just a dream. It wasn't real. Could have been. It wasn't real. Jacob had a dream and was amazed by the vision of hope and promise that he understood to be real. God really promised him that he would really give him descendants like the dust of the earth, that he would really give them a land, and that he would really keep him until the doing was done. And Jacob rejoiced. He said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. This place is none other than the house of God. I mean, Jacob was at a place. We're at a place in Hogan, Montana. Uh, tonight and tomorrow, Vanessa and I are going to go home, and we'll, if the Lord is gracious with our travel, we'll be in another place. So we are in geographical places, but in those geographical places, we're in circumstances. We're in between the storms in our lives. Windy, dry, hot. This place... God is in this place, and I didn't even know it. This place I will call Bethel. It is the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Wow. Jacob was surprised perhaps to learn that in the middle of nowhere, in a place that some would call God forsaken, God was very definitely present. God was very aware of him and very active in his behalf. And the Lord assured him, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you. Remember, he hadn't reached his destination yet. He still had to go talk to his uncle about this marriage thing. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I promised. The capacity for us to trust God and His provision and His providence, what a great word, may come easy for us when all is well. I mean, let's just be honest. You know, we can thank God from the mountaintop. Thanking God from Panama Mohinga Swamp when your compass doesn't work and you're belly deep in nasty stuff and you don't know where you are. It's a little harder to do that. Good times and blessing affirm to us the reality of God's goodness. In crisis, then, we're, we can be so fickle. It's not about God at that point. It's us, you see. <coughs> Leads us to question God's reality or His proximity. Remember Job, Job got up. Job's three friends came and sat there for a week and didn't say a word. And then after they started talking, Job probably wished they had remained quiet. It wasn't helpful. But then Job got his, his, it was his, as we say at home, his dander up and confronted God. And God said, issued Job basically what was a counseling statement. He said, come, come stand in front of me here. Where were you when I formed the earth? Where were you when I formed the seas? Did I seek your counsel? Oh, wait, you weren't there. No, I didn't, did I? kind of puts things back in perspective. We might think that those hard times mean God has deserted us. And whether we want to admit it or not, we may feel angry with God. My mother used to tell me, never be angry with God and never question God. I'm not sure about the truth and wisdom of that. Uh, the God I worship is bigger than my questions and bigger than my anger. 
he, um, he can handle it. When I was a captain, 82nd Airborne Division, um, I found out, I had one enlisted guy, Joe, that worked for me, and I found out that all the way up to the lieutenant colonel level, the division chaplain level, uh, there was a move afoot to take my guy, and everybody knew it but me. <laughs> and I was furious. I was furious. I was in my office, and whose voice did I hear coming down the hallway? But the lieutenant colonel, who was the division chaplain. And he came in the office and sat down on my sofa and said, well, Steve, how are things going? Boy, I let him have it with both barrels. I fired off all the claymores that I had, and he just sat there and listened. Afterwards, you know, I kind of got a cold chill. Here I am, young upstart captain. I'm wearing this lieutenant colonel out, and he just let me do it. Uh, and then at the end, he said, well, you know what? I believe you're right. Wasn't prepared for that, but my point is, he was bigger than my frustration. He was bigger than my hollering. He was bigger than all the, yeah, that was coming his way. He he can handle that. God can handle that. Because in those God-forsaken times, our lives may seem to be more like a desert than a paradise, and God may seem to be very distant, not very close. He proudly uh, wore his Purple Hearts Combat Infantryman's badge, a bull riding championship belt buckle, and a big handlebar mustache. And for our purposes today, we'll call him Rex. Rex was a patient at the Louisville, uh, Kentucky Veterans Administration Hospital. He was also a member of the post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a diagnosis support group. He was uh, sort of the stereotypical TV combat veteran, loved the adrenaline boost that comes with thrill-seeking behaviors. And after a year and change of living on adrenaline in combat in the Republic of Vietnam, Rex came home to find that all his safe answers, all his Sunday school answers about life, about how life should be lived, had been upset and shaken to the core, and he questioned Everything he once held, uh, everything he once believed, and the things he held dear about faith and matters of God and the earth. He came home with some hard questions and, and deep doubts about the nature of humanity. And he wondered where God was in all of that. Why didn't God just fix it? Why did God allow bad things to happen to him and to the people around him? Why did God... Uh, not seem to rescue him from the chaos and the life that just seemed so random. Uh, you're standing here and the person next to you catches the bullet. How random is that? A uh, guy going home in two weeks gets hit in the back by a rocket, in the back by a, by a rocket, on the treadmill in the gym. How random is that? Kid walks out of the gym around the big concrete T wall, uh, that thick at the top, walks around that and catches a bullet in the chest and is dead on the spot. How random is that? Pretty random. Well, Rex was angry about all those kinds of things. I just described to you some more contemporary things, but he was angry about that. And people just pigeon-told him as another crazy Vietnam vet. That's stereotype off TV. So in his anger and despair, Rex denounced his faith, faith that he claimed since his youth. He ignored his moral compass and immersed himself in base behaviors that you and I might call immoral. And by the time he was done, his wild, unrestrained living and thrill-seeking had cost him his family, cost him his health, cost him his future. He felt totally misunderstood. How do you explain things like that to your family? How do you explain to them that you've been involved in an intimate contact with, with things that one human should never do to another when their understanding of uh, combat has been shaped by 
Gregory Peck and John Wayne, and not that that's bad. I love John Wayne, but it's, it's just not that. It's different. Rex said that if they hadn't been there, they won't understand. You can't talk to them. And if you were to tell them the truth, they would never let you come in the house. So he felt totally isolated and abandoned, alone. And as days went by, he became more angry and more lonely and more cut off. But then he found some solace. He found it on the bull riding circuit in a rodeo. That big hairy-chested, action-focused man world for him as he understood it. He found some folks who could see right through him. They saw him for what he was, and they loved him for what he was, and they shared life on a common level. He found some people who knew him. Now on the rodeo circuit, he broke his pelvis twice, several other significant injuries added to his machismo and his war wounds. But somehow in the rodeo, Rex found peace with God and restoration of his faith, and he found the demise of his demons from Vietnam. Uh, he continued to experience troubled dreams and flashbacks and startle response and things that just characterize having come from there. But he developed a theology that had been shaped by war and life and the goodness of God, and he was able to draw the knot and find peace with it all. The story has a happy ending for him. Um, according to Rex, Rex's life is like riding a bull named Thunder. You get in the chute and you cinch up, and when the gate opens, you think you're going to ride the bull for eight seconds. But the bull has other ideas. He said, sometimes you get a tornado bull, just a spinner, goes in circles. Next time, it might be a runner. Maybe the one you got just is a fierce bucker. And sometimes it's just ugly and rank. Either way, Rex said, you take what the bull gives you, you hang on for dear life, and you move with the bull, and when you get in trouble, as you surely will, God will send you clowns. <laughs> And the clowns will get the bull off your back. Ride the bull, chaplain. Take what it gives you. Look for clowns and you'll be okay. What was he trying to say? He's trying to say that in the midst of that riding the bull, we've, Vanessa and I talk about, well, if you can't do that, then you just ride the lightning. You know, you just suck it up and you ride the lightning. When you're riding the bull, um, there is hope, comes in the form of clowns, uh, who will get the, the beast off your back. I told you I was going to mix metaphors between the bull and the vet and the desert and Jacob. Hopefully I didn't do too much damage. The Lord's promise was given to Jacob not in a garden, not in a paradise, not on a beautiful snow-covered peak with a grand vista of the valley and the mountains beyond, but in the heart of a desert on a 600-mile journey a long way from anywhere. He promised him, I am with you, will watch over you, and I will not leave you till I've done what I promised. Holy cow! How much better could it get? What more could we ask for than the God of the universe saying, I will give you a legacy I'll give you a land, and I will not leave you until I've done what I said I'd do. Wow. Well, we cross a lot of deserts in our lives. Sickness, divorce, trying to raise kids. I heard a story about a guy who was unmarried, had no children, published a book called Ten Commandments for Raising Children. After he was married and had a couple of little ones, he uh, edited the book and published a second edition called Ten Suggestions for Raising Children. After his kids were grown and gone, he edited the book again and published a third revision called Ten Myths About Raising Children. He finally got it, didn't he? In the course of our lives in the desert, somehow when we can agree with Jacob, when he declared, surely the Lord is in 
this place and I didn't know it. We no longer, it no longer seems like we are God forsaken. We are God attended. And the Lord God through His Son, the Lord Christ through that completed work moves into our lives to bring us peace that the world cannot give. We may not have full understanding, which is, of course, what we'd like to have. But we do have the Lord's presence and we have His promise. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. This place is the house of God, Bethel, and the gate of heaven. So I say, whether we're living in a garden or moving through a desert, we understand then that we are, we are not, nor will we ever be, God forsaken. God is in this place, wherever you are in your life today, whatever your circumstance, whatever your predicament, whatever your station in life. I like that word because that's where you are. God is there. He has promises for you and He has hope. And we are never God forsaken. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this day. We thank You for the good life that is ours because of the completed work of Jesus Christ for His death, His burial, His resurrection that gives us hope. Hope in life and hope beyond life. We're grateful for the grace, Lord, that has quickened our spirits uh, to run to You to find help in time of need. We pray, Lord, for those round about us who do not know Christ, who do not know this peace, who run frantically from one uh, hopeful solution, one guru, one bad habit to the next, trying to find relief and release. Lord, we pray for them. We ask that you might raise us up as witnesses to the truth, that we might tell the truth, what we saw, what we know to be true, and that your grace might bear that one up to come to know Christ and forgiveness of sins. Assure us this day, Lord, of your presence, of your provision, and of your promise. We pray in Jesus' name. Now, as we uh, conclude our time together uh, today, I, I, I want to just uh, visit with you. Uh, I know I can't sit in your, in your uh, living room at your kitchen table and talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, but that's really what I'd like to do. I, I'd like to share with you what we, we believe, what I believe is the most important message you'll ever hear. It, it's, it's certainly the most important message that we uh, have here at Mountain Valley Fellowship, and, and that message is this. God loves you. The Bible says in John 3:16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. You put your name in. God loves you. You may not know that, understand that, believe that, accept, but I'm just telling you, based upon the Word of God, God wants you to know that today. He wants you to know He loves you. And He wants to know that if you believe in Him, not with just your head, but with your heart, you, if you'll trust Him and commit your life to Him, he will come into your life and you'll become a brand new person forever. You see, the great thing about God and, and, and His message for you is that um, it's, it's not just preacher talk. You know, us preachers are good at, you know, God, God backed His statement up. God said He loved you and, he, and then He proved it. He, he sent His Son, His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, one day stepped out of heaven onto the earth, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life. Just think about that. Not one sin, a sinless life. One afternoon, willingly, sacrificially uh, offered himself uh, a, a, as the payment, the punishment. He took your payment, your punishment, my punishment, my payment, and he died on a cross for us. The, the scripture says this, uh, Romans 5, 8, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mercy. Now, the, the great news is that uh, not only did Jesus, God's one and only Son, come to the earth and live and die, the Bible tells us clearly that, he, that on the third day He rose from the grave. See, that's what separates Jesus from anyone else, everyone else, of all the pseudo-saviors that we've been introduced to in our world. There's only one of them, only one Savior who arose from the dead 
conquering sin, death, hell, and the grave to offer us, to offer us new life, new life. Well, okay, so why, why, why do I need new life? Well, again, the Bible's clear. It says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Way back there in the Garden of Eden, that perfect place, God had a perfect relationship with a perfect man and a woman, and one day, unfortunately, they chose to rebel against God's goodness, God's perfection, and sin. And that, as a result, the Bible tells us that that one man, sin passed upon generation after generation after generation. And the tragedy of sin is this. The wages of sin is death. There's a payment. There has to be a payment for your sin and my sin. Um, that means because of sin existing in our life, we're going to die physically. We'll, we'll, we'll experience a no death spiritually. And, and unfortunately, we'll know death eternally. But, but, but again, so, so what do we do? Well, what do you do? Well, again, my message for you is, gosh, this is so important. Right now, where you are, wherever you are, right now you can understand that God loves you, Christ died for you, and that if you'll receive Him as your personal Lord and Savior, you, you'll never be the same again. It says in, in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, Who shall, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no magical words. There's no magical place. Uh, John 1, uh, 12 and 13, But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. It's real simple. If you, if you believe and receive, then according to the truth of God, you will become a child of God. Let me ask you a question. We're, we're almost through. Uh, you know, uh, this is just as personal as it gets, okay? Have you ever in your life, has there ever been a moment, a, a place, a time where, where you just, just you now, bowed your head in your heart and said, Lord God, please come into my life and change me. You see, today I'm not, I'm not talking to you about religion. I'm not talking about you if you were raised in this church or that church, if you're a good person or a bad person. Do you pray? I, that's, that's not what we're talking about. Has there ever been that time when you said, Lord God, Please come into my life and, 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 and change me. If not, why not? Why, why couldn't you today say, Lord God, right where you are, please come into my life and make, make an eternal difference. That's my prayer for you today. And, uh, you know, if I was sitting there in, in your living room and I'd, I'd just look you in the eye and tell you, hey, listen, not only God loves you, I love you. And uh, I, we just pray all the time that there comes a time, a time, a specific time, where you understand that God's personally reaching out to touch your life, to change your life, and He, and he wants to do that. Now, the great th thing about knowing God personally is that He wants you to know that you know Christ. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says, These things have I written that you might know that you have eternal life. You can know it. You know, some people say, well, I'm, I'm just... I'm just not sure. I, I think I'm saying, I think I... Listen to me. Don't, don't, please don't base your eternity, your forever and ever and ever and ever on a hope so, a think so, or a maybe so. You can know so. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, If any man be in Christ, any man, any woman can be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Today, the message is simple. God loves you. And all things in your life can become new. Listen to me. Right where you are, I just want to encourage you. You may be by yourself. You may be in a room full of people. Right where you are, just bow your head and your heart. Say, dear Lord God, you said if I called, you'd answer. Just say, Lord, please come into my life. The words are not magical. And, and I guarantee you, based upon the Word of God, this book, God will do exactly what He promised He will do. You'll not only just know that God loves you, you'll also know the love of God. Now, uh, we just like to know. We'd like to know if, if, if today, for the very first time, it only needs to happen once because when you receive Christ, He comes to your life, He never leaves you. 
If you received Christ today, you've prayed and, and, and accepted His free gift of eternal life. We'd like to know it. Uh, jot us a note, uh, old-fashioned uh, uh, mail, uh, post office box 420022, Hagen, Montana, 59842. Or, or, or shoot us an, an email message, uh, mtvalleyfellowship at gmail.com. And uh, we'd like to send you maybe some, some follow-up materials, help you grow in Christ. we we just like to rejoice with you. Listen to me. A lot of people talking about a lot of things, a lot of opinions. I believe this, I believe that. A lot of isms, a lot of churches, a lot of religions. But I'm telling you, based upon this Bible, based upon this Word, God's saying to you, I love you. Let us know what happens in your life, all right? And in the meantime, uh, you pray for me and I'll pray for you. God bless you.